bueno Good evening, everyone. Thank you for waiting. Um, welcome to Planning Commission. Um, it's Tuesday, April 5th, and I am Jenny Veach Olson, the chair. And um, so before we start with roll call, um, our vice chair, Veron Veronica Durantes Polito, cannot be with us this evening. She did let us know ahead of time that she is directing a theater production that opens this week. So we wish her the best in that. Um, so. Can I please have a motion to excuse her um, absence this evening? I'll make that motion to excuse her absence. Thank you. <laughs> Second. Perfect. And do we need to vote on that? Okay. Acosta? Aye. Yes. Dodge? Yes. Hammer? Yes. Rojas? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. Um, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Two, three, four, three. Just dance. One nation under God. Indivisible. And justice for all. <coughs> Now is time for presentation and oral communications. This is the time in the meeting set aside for members of the general public to address the Planning Commission on any item that is not on the agenda. Uh, no action or discussion shall be taken at this time except commissioners may respond to statements made or questions asked or ask for clarification. Uh, so any members of the public who would like to address the Planning Commission, please come down to the podium now. Hola. Hey, do you know if the... Okay, upon seeing any, I should have said at the top, okay. Um, I should have said at the top of the hour, translation service is available. If you hold on, hold would on, on. like a headphone, they're off to the left, and um, we can help you with that as well. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hey, uh, is, it, is that on, Jenny? It is, yeah, okay. yes. Hi, uh, my name is Tony Nunez. I'm the managing editor of the Pajaro New newspaper. I'm also the news editor at the Santa Cruz Good Times. Today, though, I'm coming to you as a member of the board of directors of the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District. I was appointed to that board on March 22nd by the county supervisors. Um, for those of you who don't know what that board is or what we do, oh, sorry, um, we were formed with the sole Maryland. intention Maryland. of buying Watsonville Community Hospital last, and bringing it back into public ownership um, yeah. we had now we've now had three yeah. meetings uh, we had one or two of them excuse me um, immediately after being appointed to the board one on a Thursday another one on a Saturday and I, I come here today okay. to, uh, yeah, to bring up two things right one is that the job of buying Watsonville Community Hospital is not done yet uh, we still have a lot of work to do I think a, a, a recent article in the Santa Cruz Sentinel came out that we still have to raise close to $20 million in order to finish the purchase of the hospital. And I think up until this point, some of the reporting has left yeah, so some, some of those facts out me. that we still need $20 million to finish this purchase of Watsonville Community Hospital and bring it back into public ownership. And more than that, to save it, because it is more than likely that if we do not buy this hospital, it will close and that will be very bad for the entire Central Coast, not just Watsonville, but Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And so um, please uh, let everyone know that this job is still not finished and also that we meet the first and third Thursdays of every month at 5 p.m. at the Kathleen King Room at the Community Health Trust of Pajaro Valley. And that's over right next to 
the entrance to Watsonville Community Hospital. So thank you so much for your time and I appreciate any help that you guys could send our way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the public, um, I'll open it up to oral communications from members of the Planning Commission. Commissioner Dodge. I always have something. You do. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's, I can't tell you how uh, exciting it is to be back in these chambers and to see them full of people, residents and members of our community. So thank you. Excuse me for a moment while I go on a little bit. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to my friends uh, in a band called Los Lobos who won a Grammy last night, uh, friends of mine for maybe 50 years. <laughs> um, helped put Watsonville on the map with the famous earth concert in the earthquakes with Santana in 1989. But more so, um, a lifetime of, uh, of, of work um, was honored in what a great achievement. And uh, sometimes I talk about things that aren't so exciting, but I'm really happy for, uh, for my friends and, and uh, the great role models that they are. So that being said, I currently want to uh, address what I've been addressing at these meetings for quite a, uh, a while. And that's uh, the city urban limit line. Uh, there's a measure that's going to be able to come forward in November. I believe the city council put it on the ballot in November, um, just to let people, there's a, maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with it. Um, I am a, against that measure. I use this podium to say so. It would stun the growth of Watsonville. We don't have enough. Look, we have an item on our agenda this evening where we're talking still about growth issues. Um, the city did a recent report, a summary of findings, which came out with facts and f some figures about um, the history of that urban limit line um, and why we need to be able to expand our economic base outside our city, current city limits. Well, actually, it isn't the city limits, but outside, outside by the highway. How about that? So I'll, I'll say that. Uh, pay attention to it. Um, measure U, I helped gather the original signatures in 2002. I've seen the damage is done to this community, the lack of affordable housing, the lack of new schools. All these things are, are real. And so when we, we come to meetings like this tonight, we take that information that we learn and we apply it in our lives in a civic manner and uh, participating in government. So I hope this isn't the last meeting that you all attend. This is, a, this is an issue that affects the future of all the young people here in this community to be able to remain in this community. And um, I wanna thank the city support. I also wanna say that I've heard negotiations going on between some of the members of city staff and the proponents of this measure. Um, let's, let's, let's do these things out in public. Let's put on a measure, if, if that's what the city is going to do, let's put on a measure that counters this measure. Um, let's stand up for the people and the young people in our community and offer them a future. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other commissioner? Commissioner Kammer. Thank you, Chair Feech Olson. Um, good evening, everybody. I wanted to remind people that um, because we're, well, we're in a drought, and um, the city of Watsonville does have some resources for um, saving water. Uh, they have a free consultation from city staff. They'll uh, come to your house and evaluate your water use and give you tips on how you can um, use water more wisely and lower your bill. Um, they do have a couple of um, programs to either rebate or replace less water efficient um, appliances. They have a uh, guide to drought tolerant plants, a list. Um, and they also have a landscape rebate. So it's a landscape conservation rebate program. And um, we've done it at our house. Uh, the city offers a rebate of, it's a dollar per square foot for customers to replace um, their lawns and their um, landscaping with more drought tolerant plants and uh, efficient irrigation systems. So um, if you want to do that, um, there is, I'll, I guess I'll give you the number to call. It's um, 
you want to go to the utility billing department across the street um, on, at 250 Main Street, and they also have a phone number, which is area code 831-325-3376 if you're interested in uh, replacing your water, your lawn with uh, less thirsty plants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Okay, I just had one quick announcement that the annual day of the child is coming up on April 24th, and I believe it's in the plaza this year. It's always a lovely celebration for um, children and families and brings the community together. So if you are around on that Sunday afternoon, um, please check it out. All right, let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting? So move. Thank you. And the second? second? Thank you. And a vote, please. Acosta? Aye. Yes. Uh, Dodge? Yes. Hammer? Yes. Rojas? Yes. Beach Olson? I'll abstain. I was absent. Thank you. Motion passed. Okay, on to new business. Um, I would like to uh, make a motion to continue the nomination and election of Planning Commission Chair and Vice Chair for one more month um, since we do have an absence and also a vacant seat. Um, so I've made the motion. Second. Thank you. And then. Madam Chair. Yes. Before we take a vote on this item, I would recommend opening it up to public comment for public comments on the motion to continue only. Okay. All right, we'll backtrack just a little bit. Um, if there are members of the public who would like to speak on the motion of continuing um, the election of the chair, um, I can give a brief overview of how this works. Every year, the Planning Commission, we um, nominate and elect each other to serve as chair and then vice chair of the commission and so it rotates. Um, we are missing a commissioner this evening and we have one who's vacant and so because of those absences we would like to give ourselves another month to try to have a full commission when we do this. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this motion? Okay, seeing none. Now um, May I, I ask a question? Sure. A yes. clarifying question. So since we've already continued one month, if we continue another month, will the term then be 10 months or will the term be one year from the time of election? The Planning Commission Charter states that the election happens at the, at the March meeting so um it would be until next march okay so then it would be like an 11 month term okay yeah okay. thank you any other questions okay let's go ahead with the vote please acosta yes dodge yes Hammer? Yes. Rojas? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. Motion passed? Okay. And on to our public hearings for the evening. Um, the first one is a special use permit with environmental review to allow the establishment of a performing arts facility in an existing 3,486 square foot commercial building located at 375 Main Street. We're gonna begin with a staff report, please. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. 
My name is Sarah Weichel. I'm an associate planner with the Community Development Department, and tonight staff will be discussing a special use permit application to establish a performing arts facility in an existing 3,486 square foot commercial building located at 375 Main Street. The staff report will consist in, of an overview of the following top items in the written staff report, including a brief discussion on the project location and proposed project, a discussion of general plan goals and policies in the City of Watsonville zoning ordinance, a brief look at some conditions of approval tied to the project approval, and the findings required to support, recommendation, support a recommendation of approval of the special use permit. 375 Main Street is located at the corner of West Beach Street and Main Street in downtown Watsonville, right across the street from the historic City Plaza Park. Pedestrian access is provided to the commercial building off of Main Street um, and to the, the um, assessor parcel number does have a second commercial building with three different commercial tenant spaces. The scope of the use permit request is just tied to the commercial building located at 375 Main Street. The general plan designation is central commercial and the zoning designation is central commercial core area. Surrounding uses inc include a variety of uh, commercial retail uses and to the rear of the site off of Strasser Alleyway and West Beach Street is a city of Watsonville parking garage with uh, ground floor retail spaces. The requested entitlement is a special use permit with environmental review. The proposed project is to establish a performing arts facility in existing 3,486 square foot commercial building. As required by the City of Watsonville zoning ordinance, a performing arts facility in downtown Watsonville in the CCA zoning district does require issuance of a special use permit from the Planning Commission. If approved this evening, the project does qualify for a class one categorical exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA, as the proposed project does not result in an expansion or intensification of the existing commercial use of the building. And the proposed project from Arts Council Santa Cruz County um, involves uh, the building is, uh, has two stories. The first floor would be dedicated as a performing arts rental space that would be administered by the Arts, arts Council of Santa Cruz County. Some of the uh, types of uh, performing arts classes the applicant wants to provide include Mexican folklorico dance classes, uh, lessons on how to play various mariachi instruments, singing classes, as well as Aztec dance classes. Additionally, the applicant um, is, uh, would be providing re uh, rehearsal space for other arts organizations to rent as made available. And then the second floor of the commercial building would be designated office space for administering the Mariposa Arts Program. This program is a partnership with Pajaro Valley Unified School District and provides arts training for uh, educators that, all, then, that they then can bring into the classroom um, and uh, provide arts and cultural learning opportunities for uh, young Watsonville residents. And as you'll see on the floor plan, it is two stories. The applicant is not proposing any tenant improvements. The uh, previous tenant, Watsonville Yoga, did do some improvements in 2016 to allow for the use being established at that time. Um, as you'll note, the main entrance for the first floor is off of Main Street, and it goes into a lobby with a, an accessible restroom adjacent to the lobby, which then provides access to the two main performing arts uh, areas that will be for rent or for open for rehearsal space. Then you'll note towards the back of that first floor up the stairs is uh, two office spaces again for uh, administering that the Mariposa Arts Program. In terms of parking, the project is located in the downtown parking district, so no additional off street, off street parking is required to establish the performing arts facility. And then briefly staff, want, uh, I just wanna discuss uh, consistency with the general plan and uh, zoning requirements. So the city of Watsonville's 2005 general plan has various goals and policies as noted in the staff report related to land that is designated central commercial in the land use diagram. Uh, this proposed project is consistent with uh, goal 4.3, policy 4.C, and implementation measure 4.C.1, which are all related to encouraging the establishment of convenient locations in the downtown central business core that provide services to serve the entire Pajaro Valley, in addition to encouraging uses that will help enliven and revitalize the downtown core area. Uh, the establishment of this performing arts facility is the type of use conditionally permitted and designed, uh, excuse me, a type of use that is envisioned by the general plan and then is conditionally permitted and implemented through the city's zoning ordinance. 
So the CCA, Central Commercial Core Area Zoning District, its purpose is to create a pedestrian-oriented downtown center with intensive commercial, financial, professional, entertainment, and cultural uses for residents within the heart of the city. Additionally, the, as noted in the staff report, the project site is located in the Main Street Marketplace related to the, in the downtown land use and architectural guidelines document that the city um, currently looks at when assessing uses in the downtown uh, core area. Again, this uh, project would provide rehearsal space for dance and musical groups and provide cultural learning opportunities for young Watsonville residents. And it gives uh, a second story office space or provides a second story office space for administering the Mariposa Arts Program. As such, this proposed use is um, would assist in activating a vacant ground floor tenant space along Main Street and would provide arts and cultural learning opportunities for local Watsonville residents. And, and then you'll note in the conditions of approval, condition of approval number 10, um, just notes that if the applicant proposes any one-time events that are outside the scope of the use permit, then they would uh, work with the community development department to attain something called a temporary use permit um, that would be submitted separately than this uh, special use permit application. As noted in the written staff report, the uh, planning commission may make the required findings in support for the establishment of this performing arts facility as required, um, as required by the zoning ordinance and specifically the special use permit required findings. And as such, uh, staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution approving the special use permit with environmental review, application number PP 2022-3163, to allow for the establishment of a performing arts facility for Arts Council of Santa Cruz County in an existing 3,486 square foot commercial building located at 375 Main Street. And with that, um, that concludes staff's report and I'm happy to answer any questions planning commissioners may have. Okay, I'll open it up to the commissioners for clarifying questions and technical questions for staff. Yes, Commissioner Dodge. Thank you very much. So just my understanding that if the, if, if the Arts Council um, is requiring for a, 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 is it a specific event did you say that would require a t temporary use permit, additional events, or, and that would just be an administrative permit that's handled through the That community. is correct, yes. So if there's any special one-time events, um, sometimes various nonprofit organizations may have uh, catering with food or may have some sort of, you know, one-time alcohol sales and there's specific permits required from the city to do something like that and that it would be considered outside of the scope of this use permit. So they would just work with city staff 30 days in advance of the event and we would be able to work with them on any additional permitting that they would need. That is correct. 30 days in advance of the community development department, am, am I correct? Correct. Yes. All right. And that, that could be issued over, like if it was um, a, a weekend event, it could be issued over a matter of days. It's not just one day as, as, as opposed, just because you said one time use. So I wanted the clarification on that. Typically we, we do issue them per, per event. Um, so if it is just a, a if it, but if it's say it's an event over like a Saturday and Sunday, then we would issue just one permit for that. Thank you. That was my question. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Other clarifying questions? Okay, um, that was my question as well. So thank you for asking that. Um, I'd like to invite the applicant for their presentation now. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Planning Commission members, uh, city staff, and you have a great audience today. <laughs> really diverse and good to have, yeah, participation like this. Uh, my name is Mireya Gomez Contreras. I am Deputy Director at Arts Council Santa Cruz County. I've been with the organization for about four, just over four years. And uh, I didn't think I'd be nervous, but I, I really care about this project. So I'm happy uh, and, and quite honored to be sharing with you a really brief presentation to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, uh, so the presentation is called An Investment in Watsonville Arts and Culture. Thanks. Yeah, I'll let you know how to, when to advance. Uh, I, I, to begin, I wanted to put right in front of you all the um, many partners that we've been working actively with for, gosh, well over two years now. These partners um, on the 
left hand side are the are the partners that'll be activating the space uh, in this facility. Uh, they're all directors of long time, um, long long established, long time established arts organizations that um, um, Ms. Winkle Weichel is that how you pronounce it? Uh, mentioned earlier. On the other side is part of our Arts uh, Stewardship Committee uh, that meets monthly, and they too have been driving kind of a bigger effort to um, build a movement for the arts. So I wanted to make sure that um, while it's an honor for me to be speaking to you today, this has truly been uh, a, a process, a deep process that has engaged lots of different arts advocates and artists. Next, please. So I really just have th three points to share with you in terms of the program. Um, it's all about expanding access to the arts. So the first thing is uh, uh, the stewardship committee and of course our partner organizations that I mentioned earlier are interested all in user-friendly space for the arts. And to us, uh, like I mentioned, that has uh, really had to do with building relationships, strategic relationships, but also strengthening the relationships that, that have existed between Arts Council and Watsonville for, for many years. Uh, and that is that those relationships have really been based on, on values of interdependence and authenticity. Next, please. Oh, oh my gosh, that's my phone. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's when my kids have to stop drinking water for the night. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did not do that on purpose, my apologies. Okay, uh, the second point is um, we're, all the partners as, as the Arts Council also is, is interested in financially accessible space, which is why uh, we're kind of really working hard to have an innovative program that really works with partners side by side, meets them where they are, and over at least the first three year period, we want to really ensure that over time there is shared financial and management of the facility. And that is something that I'm particularly interested in and look forward to kind of updating really all the community about how this is going to work. Uh, and so with that, it really is all about being in practice with uh, the shared usage of this space. Next, please. And the third point is um, we're all interested in expanding access uh, and having well-equipped space for the art. So one of the things that all, a lot of our artists oftentimes mention is, well, Santa Cruz has a lot for the arts and we don't. And so it really is about quality at the end of the day. How, and this particular building was already so well uh, situated centrally here in town. It's got the floors. We're going to do a little bit of upgrading to the floors. Um, it's got the mirrors. It, 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 it's very comfortable. And of course we have, um, uh, uh, we're working with the property manager and the owner that are really excited about this alongside alongside uh, our program leads. And so again, that all has to do and will translate into quality services for the users and youth uh, that participate in the program. And then finally, um, our collective vision is what you see here is it's uh, and we've already started to, to make happen some of these things. So it's, it's about an equitable process. It's about engaging people um, and about having concrete results. Um, and I, again, I look forward to coming back at some point and up updating you on that. Um, our three kind of goals for the next set of years is, is to successfully operate the facility alongside our partners, to fundraise so that, we can con so that this can be really um, not only transformative but sustainable long term. And then our, our third kind of area of focus is going to be about storytelling. So I don't, we don't want this to stay behind closed doors. And uh, one of the positive things is that it's right downtown. So it'll be, we'll be, all be able to see it. Uh, next, please. Finally, I wanted to thank, um, well, what, what an important uh, meeting it is because this will really trigger uh, the activation of our lease, which we've signed for five years. But I wanted to also more than thing, thank our partner organizations, which you see listed here, our property owner, Sophie Petrosis. I'm not sure if I'm cr pronouncing that correctly, but um, they've been with us when we've done a couple of the site visits and have shown a lot of excitement. So that uh, feels good and it feels right. And of course, the planning department city that have um, really grace gracefully helped us through this process. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say is, um, yeah, th this is part of a bigger ecosystem. I'm, I'm really proud that, I think there's one more slide actually. 
No, there isn't. What I wanted to say, it's, 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 I said this at the beginning, it's an honor to drive as the Arts Council. We're here for good, we're here to stay, we're here to continue investing. Um, but really, while we're driving, we're really listening to passengers about where we want to go. So um, that's probably, for me, the most important thing. And I'm open to uh, answering any questions you might have. Thank you for your presentation. I'll open it up to uh, the commissioners for any clarifying or technical questions of the applicant. I have a couple. Um, thank you so much for bringing this project to us um, this evening, and I've enjoyed getting to know more about it. So I'm wondering a little bit about your um, timeline. You had talked about five years and having a five-year lease. Um, I would hope that the intention is to stay longer than that. And so I was wondering if you could speak to what your um, dreams might be for length of or duration of stay or expanding programs or what the future might look like. Yeah. <coughs> the first thing that comes to mind is that I, I can't answer that without thinking of all of the other kind of uh, spaces that are in activation now and, and potentially will be soon, including the Porter Building. But our, you know, uh, the stewardship committee that I mentioned earlier, our, the original vision, and it's, is, it was a 10-year timeline for an, an, a state-of-the-art arts and cultural center that, was, that would reach region-wide. To activate some sort of capital campaign, we, we, needed, we wanted to make sure we were we were in good practice and knew what we were getting ourselves into. That That is still the long-term goal, and it won't be probably this particular site. But right now, what I can say is, um, if it isn't a state-of-the-art arts and cultural center, the kind of other vision is that there is uh, a set of different spaces throughout the city that will meet the interests and needs of the community uh, that wants to participate in arts and, and culture. Um, so, yeah, that th does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to open it up for a public hearing. This now is the time when members of the public who would like to address the Planning Commission on this particular agenda item are welcome to come forward. Um, please state your name and where you live. Yeah, please come down to the podium and use the microphone so that we can hear you. My name is Graciela Vega Sendejas. I am a community member, a resident of Watsonville, and a teacher. I'm also a ballet folklorico instructor and um, arts member here in Watsonville. I'm so excited to be here before the, before you, the Planning Commission. Um, this is an exciting moment because something that has been in theory and um, something that was a vision in the past, we had a, a center uh, briefly before Cabrillo College came to be in downtown Watsonville where you saw Esperanza del Valle practicing, you saw art, you saw lectures coming together, and to have this vision become tangible and to see people coming together is very exciting. So I wanna have this available to the residents of Watsonville um, to continue to make the heart of Watsonville be more vibrant through the arts and touching people's lives. In, um, in the multiplicity of ways. So, you know, just like our logo got re redesigned, you know, and the Power River flows through it, so does the arts, you know. It's like what feeds our soul, what grows our lettuce, the way that we move. And I would love for you to approve this. Um, and for, to be brief and to other honor people's time, um, you know, I, I I want to give you, um, you know, las ganas, you know, <laughs> I, want, I want you to just feel the positivity that's radiating through my veins and, you know, send it your way so that you can say, yes, this is a great idea. So, um, 
I want to honor all the people that are here. So maybe there's more people here, and hopefully you and we get a yes vote from you. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. Yes, come on down, please. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, or good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me, uh, give me some time to speak and say wow to the people that are coming out to say, you know, to bring this uh, project to the community because this is the first time I've heard about it. And um, I know there's been a few uh, arts centers that are trying to come about, but they're really not developing. But now that I hear that this program that's coming to Watsonville that is supporting our youth in arts, in dance, in poetry, in music is, is a really good positive thing that Watsonville needs. And like somebody said, Santa Cruz has everything. We don't have very much here. And we need this for our youth, our future, our children. So hopefully that you decide that this is a good program and you accept this program in our community. And, and thank you to the people that are coming out here to, to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Would you give us your name, please? Yes, just Fabian for the Leonor. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Anna Petruzis and I represent the, my family that owns the property that the applicants are filing for the permit. We'd also um, strongly like to ask for approval because not only does the building lend itself um, to this program, which Maria, thank you for this excellent thorough presentation, but for the growth and the awareness of our future and our youth in this community, I think it's just a perfect fit. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Okay, I will bring it back to the commission for a motion. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the special use permit with environmental review to allow the establishment of a performing arts center at 375 Main Street. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, commissioner Rojas will second. I would second as well. Um, any deliberation? I have a comment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see the, this project. I know um, about 10, 12 years ago when um, I was an elected official, we, we were involved in a public arts commission and um, it died along with redevelopment. And we've had so many discussions over the time period um, on, on the arts in our community. Um, even though one, no one invites me to the meetings anymore. <laughs> I just want to be able to say that, that I, I think this is, this is more than valid and needed in our community. This is, this is causing a beacon of light to radiate from our downtown corridor. And I know that we've, that we've had several, several meetings uh, on what our downtown is going to look like. Um, I've heard it for many, many years, but finally this is a, a viable project that reaches, when we, we talk about the arts in reaching our, our children and our youth, we're talking about positive changes for generations of our, our residents in our community. And I wanna thank everybody who's worked hard to um, bring this proposal for, forward to us. And um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited about it. And I, I know that nothing but, uh, cause I'm feeling the good vibes, right? Yeah, so I'm feeling the good vibes. And um, I know I made a mention of some, um, some of my musician friends earlier, and they started out in programs like this. You know, the, I heard them express possibly a Martiachi program. Um, you know, we took, my, my own theory on the decline of the Western civilization was when they took arts out of the public schools. So here we are trying to bring it back, and um, I'm much appreciative and will support this project this evening. Thank you. 
Commissioner Kammer. Thank you. Um, it's really great to see this space, which is so beautiful and was redone. I, I mean, it's just a spectacular space and it's really great to see that the arts program will go in there because um, it, it's, it's like it's the central heart of the city, that location and you bringing the arts to our community means that we have that center of our community and everything else can kind of radiate out from there. So um, I, I'm gonna support this project wholeheartedly, thank you. Any other deliberation? Thank you so much again for bringing this project and this um, application to us. Um, I believe that this is the second arts establishment special use permit that we, we the commission has um, deliberated on in, just in this calendar year. So that is very exciting and I, um, absolutely agree with what has previously been said about the importance of arts um, education, performing arts of all kinds. Um, and I really do also appreciate the collaborative spirit between um, what you all are hoping to do um, and what the uh, PV Arts has in mind and this private studio. and. Um, so we are beginning to see some very exciting and important um, uh, things happening in our downtown space. Um, seeing no further deliberation, I will call for a vote. Madam Chair, before yes. the vote is called, may I clarify with the maker of the motion in the second that the motion was to adopt the draft resolution as presented by staff? Correct. In, 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 in that, that, that is correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I'll do roll call now. Acosta? Yes. Dodge? Yes. Hammer? Yes. Rojas? Yes. Reach Olson? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, and now for our second public hearing of the evening. Um, this is uh, that the Planning Commission make a recommendation to the City Council to allow the permanent establishment of a 525 student charter school on a 2.1 acre site located at 215 Locust Street. And we will begin this with a staff report. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair, um, Planning Commissioners and members of the public. I'm Justin Meek, Principal Planner with the Community Development Department, and I'll give you tonight's staff report. Just as a quick overview, the topics I'll discuss include what the proposed project entails, the procedure for approving the permanent establishment of SABA in its current location. There's a series of topics that I'll go into greater detail uh, on, everything from land use compatibility to flood proofing concerns. I'll touch on environmental review per CEQA and the required findings that need to be made to approve the requested uh, entitlements for this project. Note the public comments that we received to date and then provide staff's recommendation. Uh, SABA currently operates a middle to high school uh, for 225 students at its location off of Locust, form landed address of 260 West Beach, it was readdressed to reflect the main driveway off Locust Street at 215. <laughs> They've been in this location since roughly 2013 after relocating from a premises uh, near us at the uh, Porter House, Porter Building across the street. The site is fairly small, it's roughly two acres in size. 
It's a relatively flat site with a single building that is just a, about a half acre in size with a mezzanine to provide classroom and other facilities in, inside the building. Uh, previously, it was used for industrial purposes such as storage or as a shipping facility, uh, but has, as I mentioned, been a school uh, for close to eight years now. This just shows the existing site plan for the site, showing the outline of the property and site access, site circulation coming into and around the building, where the parking places are located. Uh, noting that St. Malos, it's a little hard to read at this scale, but uh, some of the areas in front of the building are used as sort of outside activity areas. And of course, there's some outside seating uh, for kids to enjoy um, their lunches. There's some bike parking near the entrance. And of course, there's accessible parking spaces and striping into the site. And I'll touch on that a little bit further as we talk about this project. Surrounding the site are on two sides residences, uh, primarily single family residences, and the other two side industrial type uses, such as a beverage warehousing and distribution facility and some construction trade contractor yards. Uh, in close proximity to the site is also a major truck route in the form of Riverside Drive, which is part of the state highway system. And then local streets such as Locust, Second Pine and others are, are nearby to this location. Presently, and this is the reason why it's going before you tonight for a recommendation, the site is designated for industrial development and that reflects its past uses. Uh, and near uh, adjoining the residential properties are of course designated for low density single family homes. And so as part of the recognition of the existing school use on a permanent basis, having obtained a use permit on a temporary basis uh, a little, um, with a time limit of 10 years, requires the redesignation of the site to reflect its quasi public nature of the school use and corresponding rezoning from general industrial to institutional. With that, uh, with those legislative changes of changing the general plan land use map or what we call the land use diagram and rezoning, uh, the issuance of a special use permit is allowed on a conditional basis. And these are just highlighted from the exhibits that show the changes from industrial to public, quasi-public and IG to N or institutional. And in terms of the procedure that will be followed, um, Planning Commission is making a recommendation to Council. Council will make the final decision when it comes to changing land use designations and zoning districts. And this may be done so when the public necessity, the general community welfare, and good zoning practices permit such amendments of the general plan map. And the same procedure applies to when changing the zoning map as well. And then once the once that change goes into effect, that allows, again, for the issuance of a special use permit in the end district, since schools are not a permitted or conditionally permitted use in the IG zone. Uh, this is an, another overview slide of the topics that I'm going to address in terms of compatible use through to environmental review concerning this project. While schools are not often uh, um, located in areas that are intended for industrial type uses, uh, you can consider this to be not incompatible with the setting in that the existing industrial uses don't reflect heavy industrial uses. It has a lot of traffic, odors, or other nuisances that would be objectionable or cause safety concerns for the school itself. Um, and as you've, you've seen, um, both probably from hearing in the past, but also in the public comments that I'll touch on a little bit, there has been a lot of issues that have occurred at this site, largely having to do with ranges of nuisances, whether it's traffic congestion on locusts or other nearby streets, complaints around odors, noise, uh, even use of vacant property across the street of Locust Street for recreational activities. And so as you see as part of the, uh, as part of the resolution approving this special use permit, there's a range of conditions that are intended to address these concerns and to mitigate them for them. In terms of overall general plan conformance, I'm just going to show on the screen but not read through the range of policies that re relate to this project that come from various chapters of the general plan around children and youth, 
and working in providing educational facilities, transportation and circulation around roadway improvements and pedestrian circulation, as well as safe walkways and better pedestrian access. And of course, reducing the hazards from flooding since this area is in the, the floodplain. And not to mention that there's policies for the preservation of industrial land for the purpose of maintaining the job base and economic um, vitality of the city. The project can be found consistent with these policies in that it would allow for the continual operation of a school that provides education to 500 plus students as, and to help them achieve or provide the opportunities for them achieving their academic development as many of them will want to move on to college. The project is also required, as I alluded to earlier, to make a range of improvements to existing local streets as well as Caltrans facilities, uh, enhance the site's uh, walkway into the site for accessibility purposes, and to floodproof the existing building. Similarly, the project represents a small conversion of existing industrial land uh, <clears throat> less than 1% would be converted as part of this project and represents a very minimal change to the city's overall industrial base. In terms of consistency with the zoning district, the issuance of a special permit uh, is allowed for school uses in the institutional zone. And there's very few regulations or development standards relating to schools except for setbacks, which it complies with. You'll note that it does not comply with parking minimums for the site, but this school has been allowed to establish in its current location. And there's no room for adding additional parking spaces on site. You know, the parking study that was provided as part of the application um, shows that there's inadequate supply in that spaces off site or in the street are being utilized for, uh, during school uh, activity or during school hours. And so there's a range of conditions, again, that are intended to reduce the parking demand and help to avoid the spillover effects on nearby streets. And those are conditions 43 through 46, and they involve things like mandatory travel behavioral change, um, promotions and marking of different programs to both make people aware, but encourage people to find other modes of transportation, whether it's carpooling or biking or other kinds of modes that would reduce the number of single occupant vehicles coming to the site and so forth. In terms of overall site access, as shown on the previous slide, there are two driveways into the site. Um, as previously required, only the Locust Street is to be used by parents and children entering the site, although sometimes we hear that Riverside is used as well. The main driveway off Locust Street is for them to come on and then wrap around the site. That in large part was to ensure that queuing would occur on the premises and not in the street and address, help address the traffic congestion that occurs. One of the things that's new to this particular permit are conditions with uh, additional language around developing a safe routes to school plan that the school would be responsible for implementing. And again, the intent there is to show how kids can get to and from the school safely, whether on foot or other means. And for those that are driving to not block the street, but to come onto the site itself. And again, the, the language has been enhanced so as to make clear the responsibility of school in trying to address these congestion issues and safety concerns. Um, when staff looked at the site, they noted that there is striped path to travel into it. That actually doesn't meet uh, California building codes, accessibility requirements to have a separate pathway that divides the pedestrian pathway from the vehicle pathway. As you can see, it's that grade, which is striping. And so some of the options for modifying include everything from providing curve and paving to provide a separate path to railings or even detectable warnings that are 36, wide, 36 inches wide. And so th this has also been included as a condition. Uh, as many of you may be aware, a few years back, there was a joint effort between the city, the school, Ecology Action, and I believe RTC in developing uh, plans 
or safe route to schools plan or excuse me complete streets to school plan that had two main goals to prove the overall safety and comfort for family and children um, going to school and reduce congestion on local streets for all schools citywide including Saba. There's a number of detailed recommendations which I just have a screen capture there on the side I can't read it don't try uh, but they identify a number of en enhancements that were drawn from as part of this effort for the school to implement. Again, to provide better connections or safer uh, walkways across key intersections and segments nearby to the school itself. And this is just a map. Thankfully, it shows up this time. Uh, didn't test it out earlier, didn't. And so, and this just shows some of the key segments of concern, namely at the intersection of Second and Locust, Pine and Second, and um, um, Pine and West Beach. There are some crossings that are needed to be enhanced, and the curb ramps in many cases haven't been improved to current standards with detectable warnings or the appropriate slope. And so these are the range of improvements that have been articulated as, as conditions. I should note that you'll see that there are two other ones along Riverside. As this is a Caltrans facility, there's a separate condition, number 36, that speaks to um, submitting what's called an encroachment permit to the state for making those enhancements. Obviously, these are not local roads. We don't have local control. Uh, but that's something that, with the application for the state to do, we want to see that happen. One thing I can also mention, and uh, city engineer Mirza Rodriguez, who's with us tonight as well, can speak to is actually a conceptual 30% drawings for making enhancements on State Route 129 that's in the works right now that we just learned about or saw the drawings to within this last week that um, speaks to some of these improvements being taken on by the state in not too distant future. As I noted before, there's also concerns about flooding. This and pretty much all other properties to West Beach Street in this area are within what's called the 100-year floodplain, which means that there's a 1% annual chance of flooding any given year at the site. Uh, the base flood elevation, that's the elevation of water that could occur with that storm event, is 28 feet. The site itself has variations of slope of roughly 24 to 28 feet. The requirements when it comes to buildings that are in a floodplain are such that the building itself or the finished floor elevation, which I abbreviate here as FFE, um, must have a one foot freeboard. In other words, the, the building's floor and any equipment servicing that building need to be at least a foot above that base floor elevation. Well, it happens that a certificate of elevation confirms that it is not. And so, the options are to elevate the building or do other floodproofing techniques, including making up to that elevation water tight so as to resist hydrostatic and hydrodynamic loads and resist buoyancy in case of a 100-year flood. The project, uh, while subject to CEQA, is exempt from any further review uh, for the following reasons, namely, what you have before you right now is not the establishment of a new use, but the permanent continuance of the existing use. And since it's already existing, there wouldn't be any change or expansion or further intensification of use, and so it would qualify for what's called a Class I categorical exemption per Section 15301. Similarly, by allowing the school use on a permanent basis would not result in any significant effect on the environment. And so there's a common sense exemption under uh, section 1561 oh, subsection B3 that also speaks to projects that are not subject to further review when it can be seen that there would no, be no effect on the environment. Uh, the city has received a number of letters in opposition to the projects uh, which I've listed here before you right now and may be in the audience tonight. And they've raise a number of concerns. Uh, many of them are residents in the area, and so a lot of them have spoken about the uh, inconveniences and safety concerns they have around traffic congestion, uh, the fact that parking is utilized on the street rather than solely on the premises, 
the need for better um, crossing ground training, uh, issues around noise and littering, and general nuisance behavior of children. As I mentioned before, there are a number of conditions that are intended to address uh, these issues that we talked about here, and I can go in greater detail on those if you would, so would like. And as such, the evidence in support of making the required findings are included as part of the resolution uh, for your consideration tonight. And as such, the Planning Commission may make the required <coughs> findings in support of the general plan map amendment, zoning map amendment, and special use permit in support of this project. Some of the key findings, just so it's fresh uh, in our minds here, concerning the, the amendments itself, you know, we're talking about consistency with the policies embodied in the general plan, and the ones that I spoke to earlier have been included uh, in support of making the map amendment, um, as well as talking about the compatibility to the extent possible with the actual or general plan uses of the adjacent properties. And like, and as with the special use, a lot of the conditions tied to the special use are intended to address the incompatibility issues and the nuisances that have. Uh, uh, have been present for many years now. And those involve everything from adjusting traffic safety to make sure it's not hazardous or conflict with uh, traffic patterns in the neighborhood to roadway improvements such as enhanced crossings, ramps, and so forth, and address nuisances such as odors from the trash enclosure by providing a roof and making sure that there's more routine cleaning of the trash enclosure itself. Uh, in terms of other standards, there's a condition to require that the building be flood proof. And this will help to ensure that the public health and safety of those on the premises in the building itself um, are um, enhanced and doesn't become a further concern moving forward. So as conditioned, staff's recommendation is that the planning committee adopt the resolution recommending to, to city council to formally approve a general plan map or uh, land use diagram amendment and zoning map amendment, as well as approve a special use permit to allow the permanent establishment of a 525 student charter school for grades six through 12 in an existing 27,000 square foot building with an 8,500 square foot mezzanine on a two acre site located at 215 Locust Street. That concludes staff um, presentation. I should note, I believe the principal is with us tonight as well, and he has another presentation that he has prepared too. I'll open it up to members of the Planning Commission to ask clarifying or technical questions of city staff. Yeah, Commissioner Kammer and then Commissioner Rojas. Um, I have questions about the um, the costs of some of these projects. Is is this the appropriate time to ask that? Oh, or who's responsible for paying for some of these things? Is that is this the appropriate time? Certainly. Yeah, okay. Um, so the flood proofing. I noticed that in the um, report, in the, re the staff report, there were several um, recommendations for flood proofing the um, the site. Who's responsible for those costs? The school. The school is, okay. And then um, the Safe Routes to School plan, um, who is responsible for implementing and for the costs? Um, I did notice that um, the project list, it's $1.6 million worth of improvements that are recommended and that there are a couple of other things that are not included in there. So who's responsible for that, that cost? So for the Safe Routes to School plan, it included a wider range of improvements. You'll note that there were uh, identified improvements that were reached all the way to Walker Street and Beach and Walker Street and Second, uh, if I remember correctly, and maybe a few others. And so you'll note that the condition that we talked about nearby st local streets, there's three main intersections, not all of which that were identified in the complete streets plan for SABA. I will say that as part of that effort, and Maria can speak to this as well, when you look at the surveys that were done, a lot of the identified improvements were derived directly from 
not only local residents, but families that uh, are attempting to access. And it recognizes the importance of making these improvements to make it safer for kids and families to get to and from the school itself. So it's, there's a direct nexus. There's a tie to the improvements to benefit the school itself, and that's why it would be their responsibility. But who, who would be responsible for paying? Like, there are on the Safe Routes to School list, there are several, at least 10 recommendations. Who's responsible for, um, m number one, making sure they get done? I'm assuming that's uh, like ecology action in the city and all that collaboration. But um, who's responsible for the cost of those? Because so for the process would involve them submitting to the city an encroachment permit, identifying the need of improvements. The, and the costs would also be borne by the school themselves. Now, there may be some grant applications they may go after to help pay for it, but this would be, uh, as, as written, this would be the responsibility of the school to apply for and to finance. Okay, and then who is responsible for making sure that this happens? Is that a, the city's job? Well, ultimately, it's the school's responsibility for following through. These are conditions of approval to allow for their permanent establishment. So the expectation is they follow through with it, and the city would not have to go after them or remind them. Okay, all right. And then, um, I guess, uh, sorry, okay. No, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a question following Commissioner Kammer. So can you explain to us a little bit about what the process is for integrating the conditions? So is it that the requirements have to be fulfilled and then the permanent permit will be issued? Can you explain the, the, the sequence to us in terms of this being a conditional approval? So with approval, it's with your recommendation and ultimately council approval then it would there's a time period in which it could be challenged uh, assuming that doesn't uh, happen it would go into effect so they would have their special use permit and at which point they would be expected to make um, positive steps towards adhering to any and all of the conditions so they would go in effect at that time they would not have to implement all of them prior to uh, permit approval Okay, but is there, um, is there a time frame? I mean, I'm just trying to understand, like, how does a permanent uh, per approval get granted based on a conditional basis? Like, what are the, like, what are the consequences then? Like, and what's the timeline to fulfill? Well, it, do you have a specific um, permit in mind? Maybe I can speak to that, because some of them are ongoing, and some of them are more like capital improvement projects, right? Okay. So what about, like, for example, the... Um, the, the, the road improvements, the signage, the, like th those, those kinds of items. So those are something that we've had been in communication with the applicant for some time now. And there's been a lot of back and forth clarifications between planning and engineering and, and public works and their design professionals and the applicant themselves on what that involves and what that entails. So they've already done some preliminary work. Then. We would expect within a reasonable time frame, and that hasn't been specified in the condition themselves, but that could be articulated if desired, if you want to set a certain time frame in which we expect them to submit the, you know, for making these improvements, we can do that too. But we'd expect in a reasonable time frame given our conversation so far. Great, thank you. Um, and then my other question is, can you tell us a little bit more about what happened? I was reading the memo that discusses the the errors or the erroneous approval from like 2013, I think. Can you tell us more about what happened? Well, when we did our research looking back at the original approval, uh, I think there was um, a attempt to allow for the relocation of the school to its current location. And there was a conflation between a trade school and a school for children. And uh, staff in looking at this didn't come to the same conclusion. And that's why we made clear and drafted that memo to articulate that that was uh, not the appropriate procedure to just grant a use permit on a temporary basis without going the formal route of changing the land use designation and zoning district to allow for use permit to be granted in the first place. Thank you. Um, I have a few more questions, but I think they'll be for the applicant. Thank you. 
Yes, Commissioner, Commissioner Dodge. Uh, I was on the city council at that time, and I don't recall that that, that discussion happened about what, what, you're, what you're making reference to. So, so to call it an error is, is kind of a hindsight thing, I, I feel like, because the, the, po the project was approved at that particular time with all the facts and the data that came forward to the city council at that time. So um, I, I find it a little challenge in calling that an, an error at this current time. Um, so that being said, I've, I've already voted to approve this project originally, and um, uh, my my qu my question pertains to um, the conditions in the exhibit. Condition number forty-seven in Exhibit B, the special use permit pertaining to the off-site vacant land at two twenty-eight, two thirty-four, and that parcel. Um, not part of this application process. Could you clarify, give me a clarification on and is not approved and what is the uh, intent behind it if it's not part of this for it to uh, become part of accessible for the, the school? When we received the original application, there was a site plan that showed that property uh, identified. And in talking to the applicant, there was the discussion of whether or not they would move forward with wanting to acquire that property and turn it into a recreational facility. They decided to uh, not include it uh, for various reasons, but we just wanted to make sure that it's clear that that property is not part of this approval and cannot be used um, for school related activities. So if the applicant was able to per uh, entered into negotiations of su such to be able to acquire that property, would it become back before this commission? Yeah, they would have to amend their use permit uh, to allow for use of off-site premises. It would require an amendment, correct? Thank you. Or a modification, rather, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, seeing no further clarifying questions, um, I'd like to invite the applicant to make a presentation, please. Good evening, Chair, um, Madam Chair Veach Olson, Commissioners Acosta, Dodge, Kammer, and Rojas. Thank you for having me here this evening. My name is Josh Ripp. I'm the head of school at Seba College Prep, and I've been the school leader there for uh, six years. I'm excited to share with you tonight all about what Seba is. Um, so you can go ahead. Uh, so tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about Seba, our mission, our students served, and our history. Uh, and then I'm going to share out some of our successes that we've had with our students over the past years that we've been open. So our mission, it's in our title, we're SABA College Prep because we uh, endeavor to prepare all of our students to go to four-year colleges and universities. Uh, when SABA was founded in 2008, uh, a study was done and there was a big discrepancy between uh, the rates of students attending four-year colleges and universities in North County and South County. And the founder wanted to start a college preparatory school in South County to um, change those figures. And so in 2008, we began at the Porter Building, and we've been in existence since then. Our first graduating class was in 2015, and we're proud to say that every year, all of our students are enrolled in a two- or year, four-year university, and I'll get into that in later detail. Um, so our site, as you well know now, is at 215 Locust Street. Uh, we serve students in grades 6 through 12, a seven-year grade span. We have 525 students, uh, which works out to about 70 to 90 kids per grade level. Uh, we've been around since uh, 2008. And uh, Seba is a tree um, that grows in Central and South America. It grows deep roots, and we wanted to grow deep roots in our community. And so that's why uh, Seba became our, our name. It also stands for, it's an acronym for our values, which include creativity, effort, integrity, benevolence, and assertiveness. Um, so I wanted to provide a brief snapshot on the students who SABA serves. Uh, SABA serves a student profile that is 93.4% socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, that's higher than both the local school district and the state of Cal California considerably. A large part of that is due to the location of where we're at. Um, I think when we started, we didn't really know where our students would come from. This was going to be one option for the students of Watsonville and Pajaro and the surrounding communities to um, to attend. Uh, but what we, we saw in the Ecology Action Report when they did a heat map of where our students are located, uh, many of our students live within walking or biking distance of our school. Um, 
uh, the next stat is this uh, percentage of students who have disabilities, so special education. 13.9% uh, of our students um, have special education uh, services at SABA. And then finally, the percentage of students who were ever English learners. That's a little bit of a confusing term. This means that if they were at one time an English learner, uh, that's, this is what this is representing. So they could have been an English learner in sixth grade, then reclassified, or in eighth grade and reclassified, or even 10th grade. Uh, but at one time or another, 86% uh, of our students were uh, English learners at the school that we, um, at SABA. Uh, so as we've established, SABA was opened in 2008 with sixth and seventh graders at 315 Main Street, also known as the Porter Building. Uh, as we move forward uh, in 2014, we moved to uh, 260 West Riverside. Uh, this past year, we changed our address to reflect the fact that students and families enter on Locust Street. So our address is now 215 Locust Street. In the spring of 2015, we celebrated our first high school graduating class. In the spring of 2020, we celebrated that 40% of our students uh, had graduated from college of that uh, 2015 class. And we'll get into more details about that in a moment. Uh, finally, we're really proud of the fact that uh, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees unanimously approved our charter renewal in the fall of 2020. Um, uh, for those of you who like numbers, uh, this goes over what SABA's looked like over the years. So you can see um, at the top row, 2015, and we go downwards. Um, I'll summarize and just go over the totals. Since uh, SABA's opened, we've graduated 401 students with a high school diploma. Of those students, 96%, or 384, graduated with A to G requirements, and that's the requirements to enter the University of California system. Um, and then every year, approximately 51% of our students enroll in a two-year college and university, and that's by no means, doesn't mean that they're gonna end up at a four-year, that's just as the route that they're taking. And then about the 48% end up attending a four-year university straight away. Um, but what we're really proud about is that of our graduating students, our graduation rate over those uh, <clears throat> seven years has been 99%. All of our students are either enrolled in a two-year or four-year university upon graduation, and that's a requirement for them to graduate. Um, so we're really proud of that, and it lives up to what our name implies. Um, save us past academic performance. We talked about our high school graduation rate, graduating nearly all of our students, 99%, uh, and then Nearly all of our students, 95% are enrolled in a university upon graduation in the following fall. Um, and then 50% of our students uh, who graduated in 2015 uh, have now graduated from college. That might be a number that you might say, oh wow, why isn't it higher? Why isn't it 90%? Uh, but when you look at the actual statistics on the percentage of students who graduate from, from this particular demographic, it's, it's actually quite uh, low. If you can go to the next slide. Um, you'll see in California, students who are of uh, Latinx background and of socioeconomically disadvantaged graduated at a rate of from college at a rate of 17.4%. Even nationwide, it's 30%. So SABA is considerably outperforming the students across the state and the nation uh, with this, uh, for the students that we serve. Um, and so what I often get asked about is why. And I, I'd be lying if I'd said, oh, it's this particular curriculum or it's this. It's really a, uh, it's a combination of a number of factors. The first and the most important one is we provide a small supportive environment. And for students, many of which are high needs, this is exactly what they need. Uh, they get individualized attention and they get to come to a school where it's a family-like atmosphere. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows the front office, me, the staff members. And that community is what kind of makes SABA special. Uh, we also have high expectations for everyone. Like I said, when you graduate from SABA, you neither, either need to have enrolled in a two-year university or have applied to three, four-year universities. Uh, we also have nearly all of our students meeting the A to G requirements, and that's an expectation for all of our students uh, to graduate from SABA with that SABA high school diploma. Uh, we have a strong, inclusive community. Uh, we have a parent leadership meeting that meets monthly. When we were in person, we'd get 40 to 50 people out in our cafeteria to talk about various agenda items. We have town halls, school site councils, English learner advisory committees, parent workshops um, to kind of bring the community together uh, to make sure that everybody feels like they're a part of SABA. And then finally, we have a college focus. That's why we were founded. That's the, in our charter, and that's why we continue to exist. Um, every student who attends SABA beginning in sixth grade receives an annual college visit. They get to go out to CSUMB, Stanford, San Jose State to see what those universities are about. Um, 
And then we also support our families in the college going process through college knowledge meetings and something called Parent Institute of Quality Education. A lot of the families we serve, uh, the parents grew up in Mexico, so the whole American uh, educational system can be new, terms like G GPA or SAT. And so we go over all those terms as well as how to finance u university so they feel like they have all of the supports they need to graduate. One of the things I'm really proud of with the college focus is that every year we ensure that all of our seniors have completed the FAFSA so they, they have every opportunity to achieve uh, at the post-secondary level moving forward. Um, so that's a brief snapshot of what SABA is. Thank you again for having me here tonight, and I thank you for your consideration um, for this zoning amendment change. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to commissioners for questions for the applicant. Okay, Commissioner Rojas. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just have a few questions. So. I wanted to ask first, what is the school's plan to address the infrastructure improvements that are required for the permit? Yeah, great question. We've already reached out to our architect and have a site design and budgeted for all of the crosswalks that are recommended. And I anticipate us, uh, once we get the permitting involved, um, the, uh, um, to move forward those as soon as, as we can. I think the one on State Road 129 or Riverside might take a little bit longer because we have to go through Caltrans, but we have every expectation um, to uh, complete those improvements. One thing, and I want to say, like, we're not just doing this because, oh, it's a rule in city code XYZ. We care about our students, and we want them to be able to get to school safely. About three years ago, and I'm sure a lot of our families can remember, we had a bad accident. A student actually had to be airlifted via helicopter first, I think, to our local hospital. It was interesting hearing that public comment at the beginning. But then I think he ended up at San Jose. And a lot of that comes from the, the this was a little bit further away from SABA, but it just brought to light the absolute need to have safe routes to school. And so we have every intention of completing those safe routes. Okay. And does the school um, have sufficient budget to cover the expenses? At this time, we do. And then another question I have is, so in our packet tonight, we received um, a number of emails and letters from folks that, um, that are in favor and also opposed to the school receiving the, the permanent, the permanent um, permit. I wanted to ask, what is your um, sort of community and neighbor relations program look like? And how do you engage the local residents around the school? So prior to this hearing, we sent out a letter uh, informing that we're going to be here, and I asked them to reach out to me via phone or email if they had any questions. Uh, but outside of that, we, you know, interact. There's not a formal engagement process currently. Uh, but when we, for example, we'll have, we have swimming in the fall and the spring where we walk from our school over to Watsonville High School and walk past our neighbors, and I'll say hello to them and talk to them. But it's a, more of an informal process. And so when I walk past them, they might say, hey, uh, we noticed the Pelotero's over here, a lot of the kids are leaving trash over here, and then I'll talk to the students who might be involved and make sure that that's addressed in a prompt manner. Okay, and then um, I think those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dodge? Yes, I think that that was my, my, my questions pertaining to the conversations or, or, or that, that might involve Caltrans. I see that the that these are the the bulk of the majority of improvements are are pertaining to the uh, Locust Street Walker Street areas, but yet we are being conditioned to be able to look at some of the intersections uh, pertaining to Highway, and it's a Highway, um, one twenty nine. Um, how are those kind of discussions, and what's the plan to be able to interact with, tran with Caltrans, and I th and, and and echoing also well, what Commissioner Rojas was saying. Is this a three to five year plan? I think she's looking, and don't make me paraphrasing, I apologize. I think we're asking, what's the plan? What's the time frame? Is this three, five years, 10 years? A great question. I feel confident that we can complete all of the improvements that are stated in this outline within five years. That's the plan. <laughs> yeah. So I, it's like, uh, because uh, I, I actually I was curious tonight, so I wanted to introduce you to what SABA is, and that was the bulk of my presentation. But we do we've been working on this uh, for over a year, interacting with our architect, figuring out how to petition the Caltrans, talking to the city about how this is all going to work. Um, so we have a plan, and I'm very confident that we're going to get this plan to completion. 
Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned a plan, right? Um, so uh, you've been there six years. And in the course of the last eight years that you guys have been there, what has been the plan to locate a new location, a permanent location, versus changing this to your permanent location? Great question. So we've looked thoroughly uh, every few years, including before we move forward with this application, for another site that would be feasible for SABA. In that thorough review, all the sites that were available were either under two acres, which is too small for a school, or not appropriately zoned. And so in conducting that search, we realized that really right where we're at, 215 Locust Street, is the best option for SABA. And I, I take it looking into the future, you guys are planning on growing? Uh, no, no, given our facility size, we will stay at 525 students. Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Dodge. So just to echo what, what Commissioner Acosta was saying is that in your search for vacant parcels and compatible parcels inside the city limits of Watsonville, you've been unsuccessful in finding something that accommodates a school or this project of two acres. That is correct. Because we get all the time about all this vacant space in Watsonville. And in your opinion, is there vacant space in Watsonville? There is no vacant space in Thank Watsonville. you very much. I agree with you. <laughs> Any further questions for the applicant? I just want to add to that at the current time, right? There's no vacant space at the current time. Correct. Oh, correct. Right. I think that needs clarification. Um, there is vacant space. It's just not zoned N. And this, you as a school are an institution and you're permitted in N zones. But we are looking at a zone change. So I don't think we can say that there are no spaces available. I think to clarify, it would be maybe there are no appropriately zoned for school site Spaces. I think and I think that's really important because what we're being tasked with this evening is to is a rezone and that is that's part of our um, approval process for this evening yeah I, I appreciate that clarification and I'd also like to provide a little bit of clarification um, many of the spaces that are available might be a church or some it was used for this other summer mixed uh, some other mixed use facility when Saba took hold of this particular property, and I think it was in the prep, uh, presentation, it was actually a DHL transportation facility. And so Sabit spent in leasehold improvements $5 million to convert that to a school. And so when we look around at, oh, let's just abandon this and everything we've done to come this far and say, let's go over to that vacant church and make that into a school and we'll rezone it over there. Um, it's not as simple as just a rezoning project or even finding a space of land that's two acres that meets that need. There's a number, number of other considerations that go into a factor, uh, that factor. And so I think when you look at it holistically and see all of the different circumstances that are required for a charter school to exist, this site is kind of unique in that it can serve SABA in the, in the, man, in the manner that it does. Thank you very much for offering that clarification. That was what I was addressing was the vacant use for school, for a school, and particularly in this episode, although I do agree that then we can have the conversation on result, and I'm sure we will, which is part of the urban limit line that I brought up earlier, the conversation for land use in Watsonville. But I, I commend you for bringing forward this and the improvements that you made previously on the property. So thank you. Any clarify any further clarifying questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I would like to open it up for public hearing and public comment. Um, so any members of the public who would like to address the commission on this agenda item, um, you are welcome to come down to the podium um, in anticipation of several of you wanting to speak please just come up right now and form a line and that'll help us keep things moving along 
Oh, and please be sure to state your name so we can record it in the minutes. My name is Florida Bell. A lot of people, mostly students, have like different opinions. Some of them think it's a little too limited or but it can also be like I think of it as a small mini community you know the teachers will always be there for you they're always willing to help out and Also, create um, a small. The fact that it's a small place, it creates a lot of bonds and connections between like everyone because everyone knows everyone in the class, in the teachers, and almost all the students. Um, you know that the teachers aren't just there to work and teach; they work for you. And um, I've been me and Co I've been here since eighth grade. The moment we met, we connected. Um, it means a lot to a lot of the students there. It, like she said, it's a small like school, so. I feel like this school has a like. The students and the teachers have a nice bond, and I haven't seen that. So it's really nice, so you feel Thank you for your comments. Good afternoon, my name is Emily Chavez. Um, has many meanings for me. Not only did it give me enough communication, but I also got the opportunity to be an intern here. And now I'm here in Baltimore for the past three years um, at SABA. So at SABA, we are not just a school, we're also a community. Um, where we encourage change, where we encourage students to meet their different challenges. We work together to create a space where our students feel safe, um, where parents know that we listen to their concerns and their requests, um, acknowledge them, and appreciate their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Leonor. Um, I just like to say that um, that it would be a great thing for you guys to to permanently you know give the permission to establish the school there at Seba. This school has been a uh, a wonderful school where my children had grown. I have two boys that go there. I have a sixth grader and an eleventh grader. Uh, my eleventh grader is getting ready to go to college and I, I credit Seva for actually guiding him through all of these steps that he needs to uh, learn uh, in order to, for him to be able to go to a four-year college. And uh, he's matured there. He's become a, a, a good boy that is, uh, 
has a good vision of what he wants to do. And and I and as parents, I keep telling, I keep talking to him and saying, you know what? If you have an option of being a firefighter or a police officer or a lawyer or whatever, you know, keep your op- options open. And that's what Seva does. They tell, they talk to them and they let them know this is what you have in front of you. You know, keep your doors open. Keep your, you know, so that you can um, excel in life. So um, I just like to say that. Uh, that I know that we had some troubles with the streets before, and my wife and I addressed that at one point about three years ago. And uh, and Mr. Rip, thank you for addressing that because that's one of the things that uh, concerned a lot of our parents, the crossings. Uh, and I know that there was Caltrans involved, and it's not city. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Daniel Dodge, Jr., 618 Lincoln Street, Watsonville, California, lifelong Watsonville resident, father and uncle to many, Pajaro Valley Unified School District, and charter school children. For more than a decade, SABA has always been a homegrown Watsonville charter school. For more than a decade, SABA has always followed the city of Watsonville's rules, regulations, and guidelines. For more than a decade, SABA has always invested in Watsonville, whether at the Porter Building or the location it is at now. All of us are here today are asking you to please approve this agenda item so we can have at least another decade for all these young children to be able to attend the school. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Imelda Hernandez. Good evening, Planning Commission and community members. My name is Imelda Hernandez, and tonight I was asked to come by Mr. Rip to share what SEBA means to me. I'm a mother of three boys. When I first heard about SEBA, I remember as if it was yesterday. I had seen a flyer posted at Star Hat Pizza where it said SEBA College Prep, a charter school that prepares students for college, now enrolling. They were now accepting applications. During that time, I believe my son was barely in fourth grade, and that is when I knew that my son would be attending Saba College Prep for middle school. When he was in fifth grade, I started getting information of what I needed to do to get him enrolled in Saba. I was told that it was all through a lottery, which meant it was not a guarantee that he would be attending Saba. When it was time to enroll, I talked to my son and told him about Saba. He was very hesitant. At first, he didn't want to attend SABA because all of his friends were going to go to Lakeview Middle School. It took a little convincing, a little reverse psychology, and negotiation. I told him that there were some steps that needed to happen before we knew if he was going to be attending SABA. First, we had to apply, submit the application, then we would have to wait for the drawing. If our name was drawn, then I told him that it was meant to be. I convinced him that he should give Save an opportunity for at least one year, and after that year is over, we would talk. And if he decided that he didn't want to stay at Save, then we would transfer him to Lakeview. So he went on and started and completed sixth grade. By the end of that year, I asked him if he wanted to stay at Save or transfer to Lakeview. By then, he had made friends, really enjoyed his teachers, and decided to stay. Now, nine years later, he is a SABA alumni and a student at Oregon State University. He is pursuing a degree in civil engineering and has his summer internship in Long Beach. My other two boys are currently attending SABA. One is in ninth grade and the other one is in seventh grade. I am hoping that my two other sons follow his footsteps. I am hoping that in the next two years, my firstborn child will be graduating from Oregon State University with his degree in civil engineering and then he will have accomplished SABA's mission to prepare students in the Watsonville area to graduate from four-year colleges and universities. Thank you for your time, and I hope tonight SABA can continue to have a home at 215 Locust Street and consider the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Nick Polayich. You received a letter from me, and I have another one. Uh, I am a lifelong resident on 2nd and Locust Street, and this has been the absolute worst nightmare I've ever seen in my life. This is incredible. To first of all, we find out this has been improperly approved in the first place years ago. This issue has nothing to do with the merits of the school. I am certain that they're, they give a very good education. What this has to do is an injustice that's been done to the neighborhood and continues to be done. I have a, here this presentation from the school official, and only now, after eight years, he's willing to do something about it. He didn't see that the traffic was plugged up 500 feet on each side of the street. Only now he realized that? Has he been going to the school? 500 feet each way, every single day that is plugged up. Can't get out of my driveway. Everybody else in the neighborhood has been complaining about this. Many people are fearful of coming here to express this. What we need to do is, there's a lot of issues here. There's been a lot of illegal stuff been going on, and there's been a lot of stuff that cannot be mitigated. Just think the idea of we're gonna have cars come in now in this new format, and they're going to have to drive around the entire building, but they can't be out in the street. That's the new proposal. So that means if the whole lot is full, someone's going to be standing outside and flagging the car to go back around the block? This, where else in this city does this happen? Where else do we have such a format? This is outrageous. Parking. Parking, the letter I presented you today, do you realize how short it is of the parking requirement that your own rules have? So is that all out the window now? Are we throwing out that many required parking spaces? I, I'm beyond belief. I've never seen anything like this. I've been involved in politics. Many of you know I've been involved in issues for a long time. I've never seen such a project. You Discount, you lower the parking requirements this much. You have this street that's narrow already. If there is a fire in the middle of the street at the time when these cars are going through, there is no way a fire truck can get there. Impossible. There's no way a police vehicle can get there. It's impossible. You've got cars parked on each side and the cars in the street, both sides, twice a day, five days a week. Find someplace else for them. There's the Kmart building that's empty. Put 10 ch charter schools inside the Kmart building. It's got parking, it's got street lights, it's got no issues with the neighbors. It's beautiful. And instead you pick this narrow street that's between a highway and another busy street and you just congest it beyond belief. I'm urging you for the sake of the neighbors, deny this pro project and give them time to find another one. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the Commission, my name is Elia Balayic, and I wish to provide input on this application from the perspective of a property that I own at 305 Locust Street, which is one block north of the project site. I request that the Commission deny the General Plan Amendment, the Zoning Amendment, and the Related Use Permit. There are a number of formal written submittals the Commission has received leading up to this meeting, which have detailed the serious adverse impacts the school operation has generated on the adjacent property for the past eight years. I wish to confirm the accuracy of those comments. Those impacts consist of chronic parking overflow, massive traffic jams on local streets, loitering and littering, and mobile food vendors which violate exclusion zones. I would like to state that the adverse impact mitigations offered by your staff are faulty and inadequate to remove the problems. The project has generated adverse impacts for eight years without relief. At a minimum, the, should, the Commission should not allow a permanent entitlement 
chill mitigations which are being offered to you with no evidence of functionality or workability, those, those mitigations should be verified before you even think about creating a permanent entitlement. Also, I'd like to point out to you, you've heard a lot of comments, but the commission, the issue before the commission tonight is really not whether a charter school is good for students. The issue for you to decide is if the zoning changes and the use permit is compatible with the adjacent uses. That's in your own zoning code. That's the essence of your duty today. Taking into account the impacts that have been documented, this use is not compatible with the adjacent uses. No functional mitigation has been offered. That is why it should be denied. I would like to point out something as well, a serious shortcoming with the staff report. There is a significant lack of details in that staff report. All that's mentioned is, is that there is some complaints about congestion. Let me describe just briefly here what we're talking about. Locust Street between Riverside Drive and 2nd Street is about 550 feet long. Each school day leading up to 8 a.m., automobiles come pouring into 2nd Street and back up while waiting to turn onto Locust Street, while Locust Street is backed up both ways. Meanwhile, hundreds of student pedestrians are arriving at the crosswalk prompting the crossing guards to halt traffic flow repeatedly for each batch of students coming to the intersection. You would have to see it to believe it. Ask yourself this, how would you like for you to have to live through that each day? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make a comment on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the commission for an appropriate motion. Yes. I'd like to make, I'd like to move staff recommendation and move Recommendation to the City Council to allow permanent establishment of a 525 student charter school located at 200, 215 Locust Street. Okay, so uh, I am clarifying your motion. Is I'm it? Okay, because I I believe we um I I so I believe we actually need to approve two items there's the general plan map amendment can, can i make a motion to do those both at the same time i believe you can well then let me let, let me read them so that they're thank they're, you they're, you're correct and i moved everything you could just around. read this the screen in front of you actually thank you very much that recommendation <laughs> as conditioned uh I live on Zoom and you would think I would know that. It's okay. As conditioned, staff recommends the Planning Commission adopt the resolutions, the City Council. One, approve a general plan amendment and zoning plan amendment. Two, approve a special use permit to allow permanent establishment of a 525 student charter school for grades six to 12 an existing well, site located on Locust Street, 215. That's, that's my motion. Thank you. I'll second it. Um, so now we're open for deliberation among commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Rojas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question I wanted to know. So the comments that Justin made earlier about the possibility of including um, language about a reasonable time frame, can we, um, amend the recommendation to include something like that? Is that possible? Is that, do I make a motion to amend the, or the recommendation? 
It would be best if you provided some more information about what your thoughts are on, because there are a number of conditions that have varying time frames. So if you could provide more clarity on what your, your proposal would be, and then maybe staff could respond, and then you could, um, to the maker of the motion, ask for that amendment. Okay. I think my, and I know there's a lot of different components, so I, I, I wouldn't know how to di dive into the complexity of the different components and the timelines, but I think for me, the greatest, um, sort of the overarching, sort of the arc of what I'm trying to say is I like to have there to be some kind of accountability and some kind of structure through which progress can be tracked. I guess that's more what I'm getting at, and I don't know exactly how to articulate that, uh, but that's kind of the spirit of what I'm, I'm wanting to ask if it's possible. If I may, Commissioner Rojas, I think you're referring to the improvements to the three intersections on local streets as outlined in condition 31, which I have open here on the screen. As you see, it doesn't specify a time frame, but, the ex but there is the expectation for the formal submittal of what we call an encroachment permit to make these improvements that involve high visibility crosswalks, appropriate signage, that the way in which um, the process which would be to make a friendly amendment to amend said condition with appropriate time frames, and then we could add something to the effect of something to the effect of, say, within a certain time frame, right? And then we could amend the language as such that would then go formally before council uh, for their consideration. So that would be the kind of direction that you could articulate and then we could include as part of the amended uh, conditions that's with this resolution. Thank you. So then based on that clarific, thank you, um, then may I make a friendly, uh, request a friendly amendment so that condition 31 include a time frame? I, I believe that uh, the principal said five years. I mean, just he said it could be completed five years. If you're thinking something different, that's, um, I'm listening. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking yeah, that the principal said the five years. I don't know, based on staff's recommendation, if that is, you, you use the word reasonable, so I don't know if that falls within your definition of reasonable. Well, I, I, we also have city engineer, oh. assistant public works director, Maria Esa Rodriguez. So whenever we talk about capital improvement projects, that's largely done by the public works department. So I would like to involve Maria in answering that question. Good evening, commissioners. Evening. A reasonable time frame that could be put forth. I think to obtain an encroachment permit, I know they we have had conversations. They are working with, they have an engineer on board, an architect that have been working on improvement plans. And um, sa uh, student safety is a major concern. So perhaps the uh, submittal of a permit I would say that could probably go a lot sooner than five years, the submittal of the permit. Yeah. Um, uh, and we're open for suggestions, but since it's been an ongoing issue, maybe within, I don't know, six months to a year time frame, if that could work. And then that work is done over a period of time. Um, and I think those permits are all, all also good for about six months. So, and I can offer that information and we can go from there. Really helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Commissioner Dodge, would you accept my friendly amendment? For 18 months? I, I think I would do 12 based on the recommendation that was just made that six to 12 was reasonable. And that's with the school that And so what we're talking with the 12 months is to be able to submit an encroachment permit within sub mm -hmm. yeah to submit the permit within 12 months okay thank you does the second agree <laughs> madam chair you were the second yes i accept that okay yes okay. absolutely um you know i look into the crowd and i i i, I can reflect quite a bit on uh, when my kids were in charter school here at PVUSD. 
Um, and I see the passion. I see, um, I see the parents that have shown up, the children that have shown up, um, and uh, I'm proud of you all. I'm proud of you. I think that you know that you know when my when my uh, three kids went to charter and went on and to their endeavors, and one graduated from UCSB and one graduated from Berkeley, and 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 the other one's still working on it. So, you know, it it really takes you all coming together as one, right, to make this work. Um, and I commend you all. Um, and there's always the however, right. Um, and that's where I'm a little stuck. Um, it's a hard pill for the community to swallow, those people that live in that, in that community. And that's really what it's about right now. Um, look, I've lived in areas where things have changed. Change is very difficult, right? And what's more difficult is the unknown, when you really don't know what's gonna happen in the future. And quite honestly, you, you guys are amazing. You guys. You, you all, um, you won't skip a beat. I can see it. Um, and basically, what's my point on this? My point is that uh, I, I'm a little concerned because we're saying permanent. We're using words like permanent. So it's a permanent location, right? And then we're changing the zoning. I, I'm, I just, I, I can't, I can't, I can't be part of that. I think that, you know, the, there's quite a few people in that, in that district or that area there that are, weren't willing to come out and speak. They were, they were scared to come out and speak. Um, and as a voice for them, I, I'm here for them. Thank you. Commissioner Kammer. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say that the, the goals of SEBA are quite commendable and um, admirable. And, and the parents, the couple of parents that spoke, um, echoing what um, Commissioner Acosta said, that the passion was definitely there. Um, but as we see it's not whether or not this it, w before us is not whether or not the school should be in existence it's whether or not we should make a zone change um, and in that area if you look at a zoning map everything in that area is ig or single family residential so r1 um, and this is a zone change that is not compatible with the surrounding uses. We get, um, supportive evidence of, for the, the policies in the general plan. And I'm seeing a lot of policies that this, um, that are not being supported here. For example, um, Children and Youth Element Goal 7.1, ensure a secure, healthy, and safe environment for the children and youth. It, it doesn't seem, looking at the survey that many of you probably did as parents, and I, I'll say I live right around the corner from a school. I know exactly what it's like to have a whole bunch of cars and a whole bunch of parents and the vendors and the whole deal because I deal with it all the time. Um, it, it really is, it takes that, that's why schools are in certain areas because schools serve a certain function and th this, the school is not a compatible use for that area. Um, I'm just, and I'm also concerned about, this is um, policy 7E, educational and training systems. City of Watsonville shall collaborate with the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of collaboration with the district on this. You're a school, but how, where's the collaboration with the district? I'm just not seeing that um, 
this proposal is meeting the goals of the general plan. And that's why I am going to be voting um, against moving this, uh, uh, against this proposal, period. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I ask a question to staff? Uh, yes, Commissioner Dodge. This is drawn off the 2005 general plan because our 2035 general plan was ruled invalid by the court. So this general plan that we're looking at was created in the 1990s, I believe. Am I correct? That's correct. So we're really articulating something that one of the commissioners brought about by a plan that was written over 20-something years ago. The policies and goals that are referenced are from the 20, 2005 general plan, which was, again, adopted in the early 90s, correct? In the, in the early, early 90s. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm so glad that there's so many people here to witness what happens in democracy, all right? We might not all agree on facts and figures, but we all have, have to come to a consensus, and that's what will happen with this, this vote. I've, been my, I've expressed my issues with the general plan, being out of compliance, uh, not, not having one, after a whole process of community members got together. So uh, this is a recommendation to go to the, plant, to the city council. So this is not the last that this conversation will be had. So I uh, invite everyone to attend that meeting if, um, if this motion is successful in going forward. So thank you, staff. With, with all due respect, uh, Commissioner Dodge, mm -hmm. um, I, I agree, this is going to the planning commissioner, and, um, but th these are the beginning steps of where it goes. So you know, we, th this is where we start the dialogue. So uh, we just all need to be mindful that you know, when we make this decision, this decision is gonna carry on. So. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Okay, at this point, we are uh, in a position where staff has not prepared um, findings to deny the use permit. So in the sake of not having adequate um, votes, we do need to continue this item to our next meeting. Um, wait, wait, wait. Can you be a clear, yeah, clarification? Oh. How are we not going to make a vote? We already made a motion. Now we're, we're not going to continue. We that can. We so. So, I'll, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. So there is a motion on the table. That's correct. correct. Yes. Yes. So the issue that um, I am concerned with is that the recommendation before you tonight is in the form of a resolution that staff has prepared to support their recommendation, which is to recommend uh, approval of the general plan and zoning amendments to the council, as well as the special use permit. So if, if the planning commission is going to recommend denial, we should have a resolution that supports that recommendation and the basis for that recommendation. You, 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 aren't, you aren't counting vote, you're counting votes before an action happens. I find this, I, that, I sat through these, go ahead, Ed. No, Ed, I, that's absolutely wrong, I'm sorry, but you, I heard you three talking over here, and that's, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, I mean, okay. So, I, if that, I may. Go ahead. Madam Chair, if I may, through you. So we weren't counting votes, we're trying to, to figure out if there's findings to support Excuse, the determination. There's a motion on the table right now let's vote on that motion and then you can articulate a statement i find this i've been through hundreds of these meetings thousands i find this embarrassing uh, this, this is appalling what you guys are doing over here because i i'm listening to what you guys are you guys are carrying a conversation on the side about what you're going to do trying to you know slow the things down instead of saying hey we already have a motion on the table uh, that's not transparency however on page 5 of 16 in the staff report at the very top, it says, the concept of public welfare is broad and inclusive. Were the Planning Commission to determine based on substantial evidence that it could not make the finding that the project is compatible with adjacent development, 
or protects public health, safety, and welfare, then it could not recommend to the city council approval of, of the project. I, I call this, a question. Excuse me. Call a question. I, you, I'm not finished. And please continue, but like if you, what you just read says- Commissioner Dodge, Commissioner please allow Commissioner Cameron to finish. The failure to find this or any one of the required findings would cause denial of the requested special use permit. So I, I'm not sure how that fits in with what, what our discussion is. But. Call the question. Sorry. Okay, I will. I, I did read Commissioner, that, so Commissioner Ross. Commissioner Rojas. I have a question. I can can um, can the city attorney please give us more? I'd like to understand more of what your what your comment was. So as was mentioned earlier, any decision that this planning commission makes needs to be based on substantial evidence, and typically what we'd like to do is put that in the form of a resolution that the Planning Commission would approve. So st typically, if, if the Planning Commission is not going to support staff's recommendation, we ask for a continuance so that staff can prepare a recommendation in line with what the Planning Commission has identified at the dais that supports their decision. And we would bring it back for the Planning Commission's further consideration. I, I, there is no, nothing that prohibits the Planning Commission from taking the vote tonight. But what that would mean is that there's nothing in writing to support the Planning Commission's decision. So we could either bring it back for ratification for the Planning Commission's consideration at a later date, or we could continue this item for a further date so that staff can prepare a, a resolution in line with what they've heard tonight if the vote is to not recommend this item. I, I, go ahead. I, I just have a follow-up question. So what is our what is our past practice? Like w when we come to these meetings, we don't have a resolution pre-written before and I mean for and against, right? We so actually have. We have had instances where we have had both. Okay, so, mm -hmm. it is, so is that a common practice every time? No. So in what circumstances is it a common practice? It's generally a common practice when we are, uh, as staff, um, concerned that an item is not going to pass. So we will present, um, we will prepare findings for and against. And you base that, what's that based on? Generally, it's um, conversations in the community or what we've heard from, from the community. Okay, so for tonight, mm -hmm. Uh, if were you were you not anticipating is that why there isn't sort of the two versions we did not receive uh, community feedback or or any of these emails until this week so no we did not have time what we would have to do if we were preparing findings and a resolution um, against that has to be included in the packet and noticed as well well if if if, if it's our past practice to have sort of multiple versions of a resolution to look at, then I would be fine supporting the, I don't know if it was a recommendation to, to continue, um, but that, that's, I, I'm, I'm for being more cautious than, that, that's where I land. I'd like to have more information. I, 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 I just can't believe that our staff would allow this to happen in front of all these folks. This is very embarrassing. This is embarrassing. Very embarrassing. And, and for you to be able to do that and communicate while there's a motion on the floor, I, I, I'm, I'm, if, if this, motion, this motion needs to go forward, if it's successful, and if it's not, then that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm upset if it fails, you know, because I'm not, I'm not the one it has to be explained to. What, what staff has done by allowing this to happen is, is embarrassing. It's taken the time up of all these community members it, it's, it should not have been brought for us. It should have been put if that was what it was going to be because it is, they've, there, there have been motions before that you can find this and you can find that. My motion was in favor of staff's findings. So well, if I, I may, I, quite honestly, I, I just want to say, I, I want to apologize to you all sitting out there. I, I apologize to you. Um, it's unfortunate that we're here, um, but, uh, is not a good this is not a good situation and I'm looking across 
at you all, and it, I just have blind eyes. I mean, you, you guys, I, what happened here? Well, I apologize for the misunderstanding. What I would suggest is we go ahead and vote on this. If the motion fails, that we continue this to the next item or to the next uh, planning commission hearing so that staff can bring back findings, appropriate findings. So just so I understand, so we would vote tonight and then at the next meeting we would look at a resolution to adopt? If the motion fails. If the motion fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is, can I, I'm sorry, another question. Oh, please, please. Does that, does that impact the city council's schedule then of having this item before them? Yes, because if it gets continued to our next meeting, then we will finish it there and it gets and, and, and then we'll, pushed back. Again, I can't believe that you're operating under the assumption that it's going to fail. It, 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 we'd be, it, we've been second guessing everything that we, d we do for, um, but if, if that reality happens, then we're going to vote on a resolution to allow negative findings with two absent seats. Yes, Commissioner Kammer. Um, I wanted to remind the public as well as planning commissioners that um, when we get the packet, our job is to look at, read the packet thoroughly, look at the findings, come to the meeting, listen to the staff report, public comment, deliberation, and then make a decision. From what I'm hearing, some people have made a decision before they got to this dais. And in the spirit of the public process, we need to take into account every aspect of this process from public input to staff's report to planning commissioners. And I think that's really important to remember for this, for, for any of this process that we do, for anything that we do on this planning commission. Um, I just want to say well put, uh, Commissioner Kammer. Um, and just to add to that, uh, to make it transparent, I mean, we, these packets, we don't have them for very long. We only, what do we have them for four or five days? We get them and that's what we, that's the amount of time we have to read them. So it's, you know, it's a lot of information to digest, to get the facts and to get, to really understand, um, and understand what the community wants. And, um, in, in, in all due respect to community members and the people that showed up tonight, um, this is, this is not the right way to do things. Well, we have a motion on the floor, so I do believe that we need to vote on it. Uh, yes. Would you read the motion again, please? Can you put it back on the screen? So the motion is to approve a general plan amendment and zoning map amendment and approve a special use permit application number 1737 to allow the permanent establishment of a 525 student charter school for grades six through 12 in an existing 27,000 square foot building with a 8,500 square feet of mezzanine on a two plus acre site located at 215 Locust Street, APM 017-061-51. With the amendment change. With the friendly amendment change of the uh, time frame for submittal of the encroachment permit to 12 for 12 months.
Acosta? No. Uh, Dodge? Yes. Hammer? No. Rojas? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. Motion passed? No. Sorry. It didn't pass. <laughs> I, I think the public needs a clarification to understand why this motion, even though there was a majority, uh, majority of commissioners present voted for it, why it's unsuccessful and this motion failed for what it is that you ask. Can you explain to that, Madam Attorney? So majority of the planning commissioners is four. You need four to adopt the resolution. Um, may I ask, this will now go on to council for their um, for, for their perusal, is that correct? Okay, thank you. I just have the clarifying question of whether the planning commission wants us to staff to um, bring back findings um, for denial for planning commission's consideration. The, the motion was to recommend to the planning committee, to the city council, if uh, why would we adopt negative findings if uh, if the city council is going to be able to hear hear this, even though it's unsuccessful. You just said it was, you just said the city council was going to hear this. Right. So why are we adopting negative? Why would we adopt negative findings? I I am. Yeah. I. I my, my good friend Sabalayich and I have seen things of, in each other for many years, but I got to agree with him. This is one of the strangest meetings I've ever been in my life. Well, just to clarify, Commissioner Dodge, um, the Planning Commission has failed to make a positive recommendation. Uh, I, I, and with I that, there, the Planning Commission does not have any findings to support that negative recommendation. So this will go to the city council with a negative recommendation with fine. no basis for That's that fine. recommendation. Let, let, let those with the higher pay grade make those kind of decisions for us. Okay, well, this has been one for the books. Um, Madam Secretary, do you have a report this evening? Just a short one. Um, we do have our downtown Watsonville specific plan advisory committee meeting. Uh, next one is April 14th, where we will be discussing uh, mobility options such as parking, um, bike, roadway, um, and uh, pedestrian improvements. Thank you. Uh, that officially adjourns our meeting this evening. Thank you.